Um, we're going to be talking about the carbine or the rifle mount process. And I have a couple different guns I'm going to show you here in just a second. And uh, more importantly, though, I want to remind you that, like always with these live streams, all safety rules apply. So if you're doing this with me, if you're going to grab your PCC, your carbine of any kind, your rifle, whatever you're doing this with, if you want to do this with me, please make sure that you comply with all safety rules. So make sure that you have a completely and absolutely unloaded firearm. So I'm going to unload and check this one. I'm going to double check my magwell, double check my chamber. This one is unloaded and clear. And by the way, this is one of my primary guns. This is my AR9G uh, made by Wilson Comet. This one has a pretty, a pretty fancy little paint job. I'm not sure if you can see the paint job on my Wilson Combat, but it's got the Wilson Combat logo and the uh, the stars and stripes of the flag kind of motto. It's kind of got a, uh, a burnt grayish silverish uh, paint job. This is probably one of the coolest finishes I've had in a long time. And my other gun, this is actually one of my backup guns, we used to be my primary gun, is, is standard black. I'm going to have this sucker done probably in stars and stripes, blue and red. So this one will be like my Captain America gun. By the way, I'm going to go ahead and check the chamber on this bad boy right now as well. Chamber is good. Magwell is clear. So do me a favor. If you're going to do this with me, I want you to go ahead and check your firearms. Make sure you are, in fact, unloaded and clear. Uh, and by the way, if you're a COIN member, uh, AWS member, shout out to you. ACSS member, shout out to you as well. COIN members, go ahead and throw your COIN number up there. And if you're a new viewer watching this live stream this morning, looks like we only got about 30 people on this morning, but that's okay. Uh, do me a favor and type in new and let us know where you are from, okay? Now, before I get going, one of the things I wanted to show you here is um, I recently changed out some stuff on, on the guns here. This is, uh, th this is kind of an experimentation in process. So basically, if you look at the two different guns, they're set up identical, right? So I have, I have two different optics on the firearms. Everything else on the two uh, PCCs, <clears throat> And like I said, these are AR9Gs made by Wilson Combat, is, is identical. I've got the same magwells made by Techwell. I've got the same trigger. This is the, the Wilson Combat, <coughs> excuse me, three-gun trigger. Uh, this is their modular lower. I've got ambi safeties on both guns. Uh, the only real difference in these two guns is, A, the finish. One of them obviously has this kind of a, this flag-colored finish, and then I, this one is, is standard black. Uh, and the charging handles, the charging handle is slightly different on the two guns. This one has a, a charging handle, I believe this is called the Raptor, okay? And then this charging handle is made by Techwell on this particular gun. It's called the TAC Latch, TAC Latch, T-A-C uh, Latch. I like the TAC Latch quite a bit. I also like the Raptor. I'm experimenting with both parts and pieces right now. But the only other main difference is the optic. Now, I recently put a Holo Sun, and if you haven't heard of the Holo, Holo, is it holo or is it hollow? Hollow, holo. Anyways, this is the holo sun optic on the two different guns. Um, this is a uh, lower priced optic that you're going to see on the market these days. And um, these guys, from what I've been able to tell so far, are really taking the PCC and the rifle world by storm. Um, they're they're lower price, and notice I didn't say cheap. And understand, full disclosure, they are not sponsoring me. They gave me a slight discount on the scope. I bought these with my own money, right? So these are not free products. They're not sponsors of the show. Matter of fact, I haven't even used them yet. I just put them on. I'm going to go zero them today, probably at the range or tomorrow, and then I'm going to try to break them. That's typically what I try to do. But I actually, the, the, what I want to point out to you is on one of the guns, uh, and these, these have different reticles that you can adjust. I have a red dot. You know, typically we say a red dot sight. This particular optic has an actual red dot inside of it. And the other one has a green dot. And interestingly enough, you know, I am slightly red-green colorblind. So I'm wondering, and when I say red-green colorblind, I can see red and I can see green. Those of you that are red-green colorblind, help me out here because a lot of people don't understand what that means. My kids are constantly, as I'm driving around neighborhoods, going, Dad, what is that color over there? And I'm like, well, that's, that's a red car. What color is that? Well, that's a green leaf. And I can see those colors. I just don't see the same colors or maybe the same vividness as you do. It's probably hard to describe. But anyways, the the green optic on the other gun over there has a... I'll show you the optic real quick. I don't know if you can actually see what's inside of it here. But this is the this is the 510C with the green optic. I wonder if you guys can probably not... Let's see if I can line that. Oh, there it is. You guys can you see that? Man, look at that. The, the 
ability to do this on Facebook Live is shows my talent. You can see that optic in there. Isn't that cool? Uh, anyways, that's the green optic, and if I turn the other one on, you'll be able to see the difference with the red optic. I didn't think I could actually show this on, on Facebook Live. And this one is the red. Now, some there's uh, get back over there, red optic. Oh, there you are. There we go. See that red optic in there? Anyways, um, they're both set at the same brightness. These particular 510Cs have the ability, um, you can adjust whether you you're want to see the circle reticle with the dot in the center, or if you want to just see the, um, the circle, I think, and then just the dot. Right now I have the circle and dot. It's a, it's a big, robust you know, aiming point that I can zero in the center of the zero or the A zone on a USB-SA target. But at the same time, I can take that dot in the center of the reticle itself and center it on something if I want to hit that, that, that dot, if that makes any sense. Anyways, I thought that's kind of neat that I could show you that. But I'm experimenting with that more of a green color versus the red color to see if I can actually see it better, okay? Well, this morning when I'm doing my dry fire drills, I'm going to insert a magazine with a small Rogers, um, basically what we call a dummy tab. And the dummy tab is the same tab that comes with the Cool Fire Trainer kits, okay? So that's what I'm going to rock and roll. That allows me to sit here and cycle my bolt. Uh, and, and actually uh, not chamber around and not lock the bolt to the rear. So it also allows me to have a magazine in the gun. I prefer to have a magazine in the gun when I'm doing these drills just so I can kind of simulate you know, exactly what's going on. In All right, happy Monday. So let's start talking about the, the stance and the mount position. And typically when I'm working on my mount, I'm going to work three different positions, and I want you to do the same thing with me. So if you're joining along, go ahead and grab your rifle, grab your carbine. Everything that I'm going to talk about today uh, in terms of these uh, – these rifle or carbine shooting secrets or whatever else, uh, if you will, is applicable in either platform and whatever caliber you're using. Matter of fact, if you happen to have a, um, a pistol grip shotgun or even a rifle, normal rifle uh, that you would shoot for hunting, you can apply you know, some of these principles or most of these principles to your recoil control, what I would call platform. Understand though that if you're shooting, for example, a bolt action rifle, you know, you're going to have to probably vary your position because you're working the bolt. With the pump action shotgun, you may vary the position slightly because you're working the pump, but the principles are all pretty much the same. All right, so a couple things about um, the carbine rifle in terms of principle that I want to remind you. Number one, when the control hand goes on the gun itself, the control hand always stays in the control position, excepting one time. And that is when we do a phase, what I call a phase two malfunction clearance, which I won't talk about a lot today. But the point is, if I'm a right-handed shooter and I'm shooting with my right hand, that's the control hand. The control hand always goes on the control system, which means the pistol grip, where the safety is, where the trigger is, where the mag releases and stuff like that. One of the things that I see with rifle or carbine shooters oftentimes is they'll put the control hand on the control system area. You know, then when they go to clear a malfunction, they'll take it off and they'll do this kind of stuff. So here's the bottom line. Principle number one is when the control hand goes on the control system, it stays on the control system, okay? So it stays there. So the other hand is what I call the working hand. So the hand that's up on the hand guard here is the working hand. So if I need to clear a malfunction, that's the hand that comes back and taps and racks or rips the magazine out of the gun, grabs a new magazine, you know, does all these manipulation things uh, on the rifle itself. This hand is the working hand. This hand is the control hand, assuming that I'm shooting with my right shoulder, okay? Now, if I switch to the opposite shoulder and I'm shooting with the opposite hand, now this becomes the control hand, right? This is the control hand. So this hand stays in the control area, okay? Uh, this hand does all the work. Whatever hand is on the control system stays there. It runs the safety, right? It runs the safety, it runs the trigger, it runs the mag release. When you switch hands, the other hand, for example, it runs the safety, it runs the trigger, it can run the bolt release, and in this particular case, because the mag release is on the other side of the carbine of the rifle, if I were dropping the mag out, I may reach back with my left hand and pull it out of the gun itself, okay? So that's the only time that actually varies unless you have an ambi mag release on your carbine or your rifle type system, okay? So that's number one. Number two, where does the working of the lead hand go? The working of the lead hand needs to go far enough on the front of the hand guard where I can get as much leverage against the carbine as possible. So when I say I'm talking about leverage, your arm in the position that you're pulling the rifle or the carbine back into your shoulder is going to be stronger at a more extended position than a more collapsed position. 
which is exactly why you never see any of the top three gunners shoot like this, right? See a lot of pictures like this, you know, online, Facebook, Instagram, all these cool places where all these uh, experts are that aren't really experts. But the bottom line is if you watch any of the top competitive rifle, you know, PCC shooters or three gun shooters, none of them shoot like this, unless they have some sort of shoulder or injury or handicap, or maybe they're shooting in a position that requires them to be very, very tight on the gun. They're not doing this, they're doing this. Now, some of them have their lead arm really extended and almost hyper extended, where the joint is fully extended out. I'm not a fan of that. I like to have the arm out to the point where maybe there's a slight bend, but I can still get a lot of leverage pulling the gun back up into my shoulder, okay? Now, one of the ways that I'm gonna control the carving is by obviously building my base from the ground up. So I've got a nice wide and square foot platform. If you can't see, let me move my, uh, let me move my gun here, show you this real quick. My feet on the ground are more than shoulder width, right? My right foot is slightly back if I'm shooting in a normal stance. If I were leaning to the right, I would change that and the right foot would be slightly forward. If I were leaning hard to the left, my left foot might be even farther forward because I can lean to put the pressure on that foot. So when I'm, when I'm talking about building the stance with my students these days, I always say, hey, get athletic. So what does get athletic mean? Well, get athletic means build your foot position, your lower body position in a manner where you're mobile, right? You're able to move and you're stable and balanced, okay? So stable and balanced typically means, you know, the feet are gonna be wide, the body weight's probably gonna be on the balls of your feet, your knees are gonna be somewhat bent or whatever else, okay? So that's where my, my foot position is. So once I start with the proper foot position, I'm gonna take that strong hand, and I'm gonna put it on the control system, okay? Fingers off the trigger. My strong hand thumb is always going to ride that safety. So this is of critical importance. You have to ride that safety on your rifle, AR type system, whatever else, because every time I mount the rifle with carbine, I'm gonna wipe the safety off. And if the thumb is not in the right spot, then it can't wipe that safety off, okay? So that thumb is gonna ride the safety. Lead hand is gonna go somewhere all the way as far as I can, where I still have a slight bend in my elbow, but I'm in a good position to take the rifle or the carbine system and pull it back into my chest. And then I'm gonna do what I call the drop drive press. The drop drive press is critical in terms of controlling the long gun. So let's talk about what I'm doing there. I'm going to uh, mount the stock on my chest, for me, as centered as possible. So if you look at my sternum, this is my sternum right here, my stock is gonna be just slightly to the right of my sternum, right? So it's as centered as possible. And then when I actually mount the rifle and bring it up into my face, I'm gonna drop my elbow, drive my shoulder forward, and I'm gonna press my face down into the stock. So I'm dropping, driving the shoulder forward, and I'm pressing my cheek into the cheek bone. Drop, drive, and press, okay? Drop, drop, drop. So we talked about the stance, we talked about the position, right? We talked about the control hand, we talked about the lead hand, and then when I'm actually working my mount, I'm gonna drop, drive, and press. So every time I'm out the rifle, I'm dropping my elbow down, I'm pushing my elbow down, I'm driving the shoulder forward, and I'm pressing my cheek down into the stock, okay? So when I'm working my mount position, I keep it really simple. I'm gonna work the bolt, I'm gonna take the safety, and I'm gonna put it back on. I'm gonna work, typically work three different positions. The first one is basically where I'm down at 45 degree low rate. This is, you know, we may start at, uh, on some stages that uh, require that position. Okay. Number one is from what I call a 45 degree low rate, okay? So I'm simply gonna work on mounting the carbine, drop, drive, press, fire my shot, okay? Then I'm gonna tuck, I'm gonna work the bolt, Safety is going to go back on, and I'm going to take the stock and I'm going to slip it over the top of my shoulder. This is the one that I'm going to work on that's basically applicable to a movement. So a lot of times when I move, I may take the shoulder, the, the, the uh, rifle or carbine off my shoulder, move and run, and then I'll slide right back in position. So this is mount position number two. I take the stock, I rotate it over my shoulder, I'm going to mount the rifle or carbine, drop, drive, 
press and then fire that shot. Now when I'm doing this, when I say drop, drive, press, press is a feeling. I can feel myself press my cheek weld into the stock, right, which gets my eye in alignment with the scope itself or the optic itself, if that makes sense. So we, we, we worked two positions. So number one, it was 45 degree low ready where I work, shoot. Second is stock over my shoulder where I work and shoot. And the third is where I basically take the stock and I'm going to put it down near my belt. Now there are two ways you can practice this one. Number one, where the stock is truly near your belt, which is a competition starting position, right? When I'm mounting. Or you can just basically say, okay, instead of the stock over shoulder, well, now the stock is going to be under my shoulder. You know, there may be a, a time where you need to move and you need to, be, need to pull the, the carbine or the rifle off of your body and move around something. And all I'm practicing is, you know, that, that remount technique afterwards, okay? But for me, I will typically uh, practice it like I might have to do in a match. Now I'm going to, I'm going to start with my stock on my belt. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to line the muzzle up with my eye and with the target down right. So I have a target over there on the wall. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to line the muzzle up. So when I take the, the carbine of the rifle, I'm going to take the muzzle and drive it straight toward the center of the target and then fire my shot. And I work that a lot. I work on, you know, trying to drive that muzzle straight toward the target. And I want that dot to settle into place every single time where the second I mount the rifle or the carbine, I'm not moving a lot but the, the actual long gun itself. But when I get it there, I'm actually pointing it directly at the center of the target and then fire my shot. The point here is, when you, if you have a target set up, you know, maybe it's a small light switch in your room, you know, or a, a little miniature USDSA target like this one over here. You can see this one I was dry firing on earlier. Whatever you're doing, every time you mount that rifle, you know, that, that dot or the optic, you know, should be centered directly in the center. That time you were slightly high left. So when I'm working on this stuff, I'm working on the position of the stock. I'm working on trying to bring the stock to my face and not have a lot of excess movement, right? And that's why when I'm working, I work through three positions, right? Stock over shoulder. Stock on belt. And that's certainly not as smooth as I want it right there. Just what physically is going to get the carving up in the position where it settles on the center of the target as quickly as possible. You want the dot or the reticle to be as centered as possible. Remember, when the stock comes to your body and hits your chest, every different little positional change, like if the stock is a little higher, a little more left, a little more right, that's going to change what the dot is in the optic. And where, uh, where you settle and actually move the rifle when the gun stops will dictate where the dot is, which is why it's so important to learn how to mount that and feel, okay, I know exactly what it feels like to have the cheek weld in the right position so when the rifle actually settles down, the dot's right there. Right? If that makes sense. That's you know that's 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 dry fire 101. Like when 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 you do handgun draws, you're trying to stop the gun on target and then see what you need to see in terms of. Um, let me be more specific. It's not just see what you need to see. You want to see what's actually happening, and then learn from what's happening, and then develop uh, through repetitions your natural point of aim so you can see what you need to see to hit the shot. But there's no adjustment of the gun itself. You shouldn't have to take the handgun out there and go and fix the gun. I shouldn't, you know, have to take the rifle and go look for the dot, fix the gun. You know, my goal is to be able to take the rifle, mount it, and fire a dot. That was an A shot right there, right? Well, from whatever my position is, okay, that's an A. Right there. Stock on bell. That's an A. And by the way, when I'm doing this, a lot of times I'm actually taking my left hand and I'm using a lot of left hand muscle to, to move the carbine of the rifle out there. 
a lot of it, honestly, today is because my right shoulder is a little messed up. I'm not sure what I did with it. But I'm still using, this is a physical skill. When I'm working this drill, you know, I'm, I'm literally, I'm manhandling the rifle. I'm driving the rifle up, you know, as aggressively as I can. I'm not doing this. I'm not going, <sighs> slow, breathe, fire the shot. This is for speed, right? This is to get that rifle dynamically and quickly on target and stop it. And then apply your principles. Remember, drop, drive, press. And there's your there's your quiz. Yeah, that's a great question. So if I'm transitioning, you know, from one target <clears throat> to the next target, the essence of seeing and aiming, right, with your rifle is by keeping it. Uniquely enough, it's different than the handgun because we have to keep our cheek weld literally welded to the stock. If our cheek weld changes and we move the, the face at all in relation to the stock. Think about that. This is your eyeball right here in front of the optic. If our cheek weld changes at all, well then you're not gonna be able to see the optic like you saw it before. It's actually gonna move the optic in the scope itself and or make the optic or the dot disappear or the reticle disappear. So the importance of a transition or any transition is to learn that that eye needs to stay in the same spot, which means that my cheek weld needs to stay in the same spot. And the cheek, cheek weld basically is a feel or it's a touch point. Once I feel, you know, the cheek well here, boom, I can move over. But notice when I'm doing this, I'm not taking the, the stock away from my shoulder. I'm not doing this. I'm not taking my head and moving my head, right? I'm taking my, my rifle and I'm driving, boom, 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 boom. The closer I keep my cheek well to the stock, boom, 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 the more I'm going to be able to see what I need to see. So when the rifle itself, uh, is, it, the rifle itself, excuse me, Stops like I've got a little teeny tiny uh, switch right over there, and I've got a target right there. So when the rifle stops, because I'm driving aggressively with my upper body using my legs, boom, I've kept my cheek well. You know, here it is. Boom, 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 right? Because I kept my cheek well. I didn't do this. It's a physical skill. I mean, you're 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 hefting and driving and aggressively driving the sucker around pretty aggressively. Okay. Hey, Paul. Thank you for that. Yeah. And by the way, uh, a lot of times we say lead with your eyes when you're doing a target acquisition. So unless you do this, right? Or you leave, you fire a shot, and you leave the gun there, and you go. That's the only way you can truly lead with your eyes. I don't want to leave the gun here. I want to go boom. Boom with the handgun, for example, and after the second shot, boom, boom, I'm driving the gun as hard as I can. Now, I'm trying to look for where I'm trying to get the gun. I'm still looking, and because my eyes speed, my little twitch fibers, my muscles in my eyes are so fast, they may get ahead of my physical movement, but that happens more often than not, the gun, the eyes are moving at the similar speed. Now, don't mistake me answering that question by saying, I'm not looking for the spot I'm trying to shoot. Yes, but that doesn't necessarily mean the gun is behind the eyes very far. Think about this when you move the gun. If I'm aiming at a dot right there and I want to fire at, a, at another spot, so I'm going to fire a low left. There's a doorknob right there, okay? So I'm, I'm firing this boom. It's a boom, 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 okay? So I'm firing, boom, 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 boom. I'm looking for the doorknob. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, now the eyes got just slightly ahead of the doorknob. And the more narrow the swing, let's say a very narrow swing. So let's say it's from here to there. Boom, 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 boom. I'm looking, boom, 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 for the next spot. By the way, for me also, that's one of the reasons why I like a oftentimes a right to left transition with the rifle because this is very open, right? Okay, so I'm starting to look. My left eye may start to search in both eyes, come into position, boom, boom. But no, I'm looking um, for what I'm trying to transition to, but I'm not leading with my eyes by very much because everything is moving so fast. I'm driving the gun hard. The second I fire those shots, boom, boom, I'm driving the gun hard. Okay? 
Mike, you complete. There's no. There's no relationship of target acquisition and tactical and defensive, or or tactical and competition. A lot of people try to mix the two, target acquisition and defensive. No, that's completely. There's there's no relationship there. Matter of fact, a lot of trainers out there try to mirror you know marry the two. They are absolutely utterly different worlds. And here's why: because in the tactical or defensive world, you have to look and identify what uh, what your threat is. You cannot, like in a competition world, if I have three targets here, uh, and they're viable targets, I can go, you know, pop, 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 and shoot those three targets. In the defensive or tactical world, if you're in a room or a situation, and you're shooting at a target, you probably shouldn't shoot that person until you're absolutely certain that is still a threat. And I know some people say, well, what about military where you enter a room and there's three ISIS terrorists? Okay, I got that. Right, but in your preparation, your training, or whatever else, I guarantee guys that are at the highest level are threat identifying. They know for a fact that is a bad guy, and that isn't a bad guy. That's just some dude in the room or some gal in the room that happened to be in the wrong room at the wrong time. If that makes any sense, okay. So there's there's to no difference um, in the acquisition speed, but there's a completely different story going on in terms of the information you're receiving from the threat itself or the threat target, uh, which is why typical competition acquisitions are not directly applicable in a lot of tactical or defensive situations, right? In a, you know, tactical defensive situations, we want to have the ability, you know, to look at something quickly make a decision and drive the rifle there and fire shots. That's There's no doubt, that's an acquisition. But the, it takes me three quarters of a second-ish to look at something and go, okay, that's a threat, boom, drive the gun to it. Or, you know, that's not a threat, give commands. So there's a totally different, didn't want to get in a ramp there, it's a totally different ballpark there, if that makes sense. Hi, viewers, thank you very much for attending this morning. Once again, if, uh, if you're wondering on, uh, about following and watching future live events or posting your questions or whatever else or interacting, please check out the events uh, section of this page. And uh, don't forget, I'm going to leave you with this. Whatever you're doing, I've got my PCCs laying right next to me. Uh, hopefully you have your rifle or your PCC laying next to, uh, to you. Make sure to do the work. Okay, do the repetitions, okay? Um, uh, Bede, we'll talk about pistol length one of these days, but the pistol length doesn't change a lot because as we know, the arm brace is simply a shortened stock type platform uh, on the gun itself. So we'll talk about a pistol length gun. I, I'll, I'll bring a pistol length uh, AR or AR9G on the show here in the future. Okay. All right, folks, stay safe. Get your training repetitions in and have a great Monday. Take care.